All right, welcome everyone to our ninth Lunch and Learn. We are going to be talking about systems change at Journey Center. And what that's going to look like is we're going to talk a little bit about the overlap with some of our programs that you all may have heard, and then um, wrap up with ways that you all can get involved. So I am Megan Gergen. I am the Manager of Public Affairs and Communications here at Journey Center. Um, and we work with folks. Can you all see my screen okay still? Oh my goodness, assume no answer means yes. So we work with folks who've been impacted by, thanks Jess, um, domestic violence or child abuse. If you've been on a webinar before, you have heard me say and talk about our mission, but today we're gonna really look at it um, in a more specific lens, right? So we work with folks who've been impacted by or experienced domestic child abuse. So we're gonna look at the overlap of our services that foster safety and healing and prevents abuse through systemic change. What does that look like um, with some of our services? And so our core values at Journey Center, and again, we're gonna take a closer look at two of these specific core values, but we really look at resiliency, empowerment, safety, inclusion, integrity, and connectedness. Um, that's the lens through which we try to do all of our work. And that includes making an impact, making a difference, with each and every single survivor and victim that we work with. But also we wanna make sure that we're having a ripple effect throughout the community, right? That we're hoping to stop and make that change. And so what does that look like? What does it look like systems change through empowerment, right? It allows a survivor to make their own choices, but it's about education in systems with people with communities. Because if we can do that systemic change, if we can look at it through the empowerment model, one of our main goals is to reduce isolation. Again, through how we talk about domestic violence with victims or survivors, feeling less isolated and really sort of normalizing these conversations, right? And so these are all of our services here at Journey Center. And you can see that a couple are bolded. And these are the ones we're really going to pull out and look at over the next 20 minutes or so, right? Our justice and advocacy program, our housing first initiative, prevention and programming changing, uh, prevention and education programs, training, right? And then looking at that public affairs work, which is something that I spend um, a lot of my time doing. So a big part of systems change is outreach, connections, community engagement, education, and collaboration, right? We cannot do this work in a bubble. And so what that means is you all are taking part in learning something today. You're part of that systems change. Taking this conversation today, other trainings that you learn, talking about them with your coworkers, your friends, your family, that guy at the gas station, whoever it is that you feel comfortable with, right? We have these webinars and trainings to facilitate that education. It's through webinars, it's through trainings for the community, for you all, as well as for professional trainings and organizations. So we can go to folks that are working with other families, court systems, police departments. Really, we want to be in as many places as possible with those goals, right, about education, increasing knowledge about abuse, that you all or someone attending a professional training feels better prepared to help someone experience abuse, including referring to Journey Center, right, and attendees know where to access help. That is part of change, right? It is part of creating that awareness. And you all can see we are out in the community. In the last fiscal year, we talked to over 10,000 individuals this year alone, so in this first fiscal first quarter of our fiscal year, we've reached over 2,000 people talking about domestic violence, talking about training, and letting people know what those services are. Part of that collaboration also includes just awareness of our helpline. So that can be at resource tables, community events, clubs, and organizational meetings. Um, I'll give you all an example of also some collaboration with partners. So Canopy Child Advocacy Center um, is their own 501c3. However, we are still a community partner and we participate in what's called a multidisciplinary team. So our advocates, our therapists, along with Canopy, with other community partners come together to meet and really talk about and enhance services for those victims. 
we also have, you know, are on a number of other organizations and teams and collaboratives around Cuyahoga County. We're on the domestic, high, excuse me, words are hard today, y'all. Domestic violence high risk team, working with prosecutors at the city and the county level, working with other victim advocacy organizations, working with probation, working with police. Again, because if we can collaborate and not just stand alone, really working to wrap around services for victims, for families, for survivors, folks in situations, out of situations, as well as professionals doing this work, really starting and talking about those conversations. Another big part of our job around outreach, around education is the news, right? When, you know, there has been a handful of stories both nationally and locally recently that talk about domestic violence. We need to be having those conversations, but we need to be having them in a way that folks can take care of themselves and also be seen, be heard, and again, know what services are available. So part of that is having conversations when a reporter comes and says, I wanna do this story about domestic violence. Not only are we doing the story, not only are we doing the interview, but we're then having conversations with that reporter, um, with that producer, whoever it is, around how to talk about domestic violence. What are ways that we can talk about this in the media for a two minute clip, a 10 minute clip, that really provide accurate, appropriate information that also isn't maybe minimizes the triggers, right? We know that domestic violence, if you all have been to a training before, can be and is triggering. So how do we talk about those things, not only public facing, but on the back end with those reporters, with those interviewers, with those news folks to let them know, right? And this is an actual statement that we pushed out, I want to say a couple months ago, when there was another, you know, there was again, kind of is ever present a lot of things happening in our community. We want to be raising awareness, but we also want to be raising appropriate awareness. So what does that look like specifically within our justice and advocacy project or program, right? So a lot of you all attended our justice and advocacy lunch and learn a few months back. And so you know that the role of an advocate is to provide services and to listen to those clients. But what we don't always hear is the other work that our advocates are doing, right? They are always, always working to implement best practices and processes that best serve victims, right? Really having, again, those educational conversations with magistrates, with judges, with prosecutors, with probation, with clerks, right? Around what is the best way to serve this victim, right? What is the not only the best way, but what is the safest way? Working with someone in the courts who is working through a domestic violence um, charge is going to be a little bit different maybe than working with someone who had their car broken into. Both are traumas, both we don't want to be there, I don't want to be here, but understanding those dynamics and maybe it means we're not having conversations, and this is going to depend on the court, in a hallway. We're making sure that there's time that that victim feels heard away. We're making sure that there's a way to separate a victim with their perpetrator, right? Really talking to and coming through that empowerment model while also advocating for clients. What that also looks like is sort of informal as well as, as, well as formal conversations about the dynamics of domestic violence. So why is it that this victim of domestic violence isn't coming to court? Why are they not calling the prosecutor back, right? Why are they taking the steps or not taking the steps that maybe court personnel they should be? So that's on our advocates to talk about those things. I'll give you all an example. So one of my coworkers, um, and she'll use this in, in her trainings as well, she was talking to the prosecutor and she had two separate victims on that day in court. And, you know, the second victim came in and was very tearful and sad and just displaying the emotions that we think a victim should explain and, you know, was very wanting to be involved in the process and wanting to do those things. And the victim left and the prosecutor actually said to our advocate, she said, now that's a true victim. That is a excellent time for systems change within our justice system, justice system, right? So our advocate was able to say, I'm going to pause right there. 
tell me why you think that and was able to have the conversation around there's no such thing as a good victim there's no such thing as an appropriate victim or how a victim should respond right and have that conversation because we've developed relationships because the, the prosecutors and the court systems know while we're there but have that conversation around like hey let me challenge what you said why it's not appropriate um, and, and how we can change that in the future. Because every single victim, right, should be seen and heard whether or not they're displaying appropriate emotions or not. Um, another example of this, and I'm sure you all have heard about this, we all voted on it a handful of years ago, right, Marcy's Law. So when Marcy's Law was implemented, the courts a lot, what do we do? How do we do all of these things? Who does this responsibility fall with? or fall on. And so our advocates were able to, in each of the courts that were in, in each of the systems, and some that we weren't, right, working in partnership with, right, not doing for, not waiting for the courts to tell us, but in partnership with the courts to ensure that Marcy's Law was incorporated correctly, right, ensuring that every single victim has the same, you know, rights, nothing more, nothing less, to be treated with dignity and respect, right, and one of the big things was notification of court hearings, of processes, of trials, right? So those are part of where our advocates are doing that advocacy work, talking with clients, walking them through systems. But on the back end, what we don't think about is they are also having those informal and formal conversations about how to make the system better for victims, you know, challenging prosecutors or magistrates. When we hear them say something that like, mm, Let's take a step back and let's really understand the dynamics of domestic violence and the dynamics of victimization. We also, you know, one huge thing that we do for system change and plug next month, we'll be having our final lunch and learn and we'll be learning about our homicide prevention here at Journey Center, but is the danger assessment for law enforcement, right? This has been a years long project to actually change the policies of each and every single police department that responds to a domestic violence incident, right? We are working and the goal is to get to every single police station and department throughout Cuyahoga County, but it's about making that change to say, here is an evidence-based practice. We will train you in, we will help you update your policies. Will we do all of these things to help you to best serve victims and help identify victims that maybe lead a little bit more. Helping to not only identify support victims, but helping to reduce homicides in our community, right? Helping to reduce those domestic violence homicides, intimate partner homicides, because that is the goal, right? That is a huge goal that we have. And that's part of the systems change that our justice and advocacy programs are working towards. Probably our, one of our newest, I won't say our newest, but one of our newest programs is also around housing assistance. We know that 99% of victims who have been impacted by or experienced domestic violence experience some sort of financial abuse. Financial abuse, lack of access to resources, lack of access to finances makes it really, really hard to leave. Imagine you all are living with your partner, your family, whoever, and now you have to leave. How are you going to afford first month's rent security deposit? How are you going to afford rent after that or a couch or a bed or pots and pans, right? Leaving is expensive. And so our Domestic Violence Housing First Initiative, DVHFI, is really working to break those barriers and provide that financial assistance that we know victims so desperately need to be able to live on their own, to be able to, now the goal is again, empowerment, working towards that self-sufficiency of you will take on this rent, this is your home, this is your place where you and your family can feel safe. But using those evidence-based case management and practices to help break systems of poverty, of you know housing insecurity, to really provide that systemic change for victims. And then I think what folks think about a lot too with systemic change, right, is public affairs. So this is what I spend, I nerd out on policy and public affairs and it's fun for me, it's not fun for everyone, but really, you know, we can work on an individual level and we do, but looking at how we can then work at a larger level. So I will be fully transparent. I sent an email to a representative this morning. We are absolutely actively doing this work 
um, asking them to take on, you know, legislation, acting, asking them to support or oppose certain legislation and helping them understand why, right? So part of what we do is contact with our representatives around certain legislation. You know, hey, do you know about this? Here's why this is important. And not only why is this important, but here's why it's important to your community, to your constituents, to the people that you represent, right? Making sure that we're building those relationships so that we can understand, you know, that we're not just always asking, hey, can you do this? Hey, can you do this? But really understanding that like our other departments, this is a partnership. With that, we also track any legislation, both you know, locally, statewide, nationally, that can have an impact on our clients, whether it's something we think should be passed, something that we oppose, we want to be able to, to ensure that we're tracking it so that we can then know how it's going to impact our survivors, right? Probably one of the best examples I can give you all is strangulation, right? Strangulation statute recently passed in Ohio. We were uh, the last state in the nation it's a really, really good thing that it passed. However, now we're trying to work to understand how does that now impact our clients? Are prosecutors charging with strangulation? Are they charging it on their own? Are they charging it with other um, charges, right? And then is it, you know, is the charges sticking? What is it that's going on? Because we want to know how to best serve clients and how that's gonna impact folks, right? And like I said, at the local, state, national level. Going way back to those community collaborative meetings and those partnerships, we are on a handful of committees that talk and ask advocates, what are you seeing? What are you seeing as an advocate? What are your clients seeing? What are your community partners seeing? And then how can we take that back both at the state level, national level, and to other organizations to amplify those voices to help create that policy and that legislation change, right? So it looks like, this is our actual website. If you all pulled it up, this is what you would see today now in a uh, in a month. Month. This will be changing, right? Because the legislative session will start over. But we want you all, I, you know, we don't want to hold on to the information, but we want our supporters to also know what legislation we should be keeping an eye on how we should be contacting our representatives. If you scroll down on the page, you will see and be able to link to every single constituent, every single representative that represents Cuyahoga County. We have done that work for you, right? So you can click on that link and say, dear representative so-and-so, my name is Megan. I am contacting you about X, Y, Z, right? In support of, or in opposition of, and here is why. Right. You can also see on this page and you can see our website down there if you want to go to it and I can put it in the link or send it in an email later if folks are interested in that. But there are, there is updates. We want, again, you all to know what is going on. And so how can you get involved? Right. We're doing all this work, but we cannot do this work without you. So we need you all to help with that systemic change as well. So. A couple super, super easy things that you don't need to take a lot of time. Signing up for our newsletters so that you not only are monthly newsletter, but I really, really want to push our calls to action newsletter. So I'm going to skip and I'm going to go back. This is the uh, this is a call to action we sent last month to our supporters who want to receive those calls to action. As you all can see, if you would scroll down, there is a script there. We want to make it as easy as possible for you all. Hey, you know, and if this is something you want to do now, you absolutely can. House Resolution 8061, you can go to our website. We are asking folks to write their representatives and say, sign on to this important, important legislation to keep that funding available, right? We also have awareness actions that are really, really hyped up during October, during April, and then during January and February trainings, and then awareness months, right? These are the months that we all see us on social media really, really pushing that awareness and that education out. Let's Talk Tuesday, starting that conversation with folks in our community, starting those conversations. Again, that education, that awareness goes so much further than we think it goes, but it's really, really an important piece of systems change. Another thing that you all can do that again is so, so important 
is just sharing. Like, follow, share. You never know if you share something on your story, who's going to see it. You know, sharing our helpline number with a case manager, sharing our helpline number with a friend. So I'll give you all a story. I was at a, I was training a group of midwives um, a couple weeks ago. And one of the the ladies said, you know, she said, I was seeing a friend as a, as a midwife, as you do. And I considered this person to be one of my best friends. And she said, you know, and I went through my screening IPV domestic violence questions. And I asked her if she felt safe at home. And she told me no. And she said, this is someone who I considered one of my very, very good friends. And until I was in a situation to be a medical provider, she did not tell me. I had no idea this was happening and this was going on. But she had those tools, those conversations in those different settings to be able to then validate support and provide those resources. So knowing those things um, right away can go a really long way. And then as we wrap up, we've got about five minutes. Other ways for you, because I want to leave space for questions. Other ways that you all can get involved. I said this before, attend a training, donate, have conversations with your communities, your friends, your family, your kids, your students, your teachers. Have a conversation, right? Hey, I went to this lunch and learn and this Megan girl said this. What do you think about? Hey, I went to this training. Hey, saw this website. Hey, I saw, you know, what do you think about this legislation, right? Having those conversations around implications and the impact on our community. Sharing our materials. You all can contact us at our contact us page on our website. You can come pick up posters, brochures, trifolds, getting that number out. You all can also download information from our website. If you go to our resources page, there's a uh, journey center services handout. There's a healthy relationship spectrum. There are a handful of other resources that you all can use that again, we want you all to use and utilize that are very, very easy um, and at your at your uh, fingertips. Inviting Journey Center to speak at events, at tabling um, events, invite us to come and train you all, right? Providing those services and again, getting the word out. Questions, comments, concerns. I know this is like, we could talk about this for a long time. 30 minute lunch and learn is very, very short. Are there questions you all have? 